This is a podcast where real doctors discuss fake medical emergencies. That means that unless you've been bitten by a radioactive spider or sprained your ankle on the holodeck, this podcast is not medical advice. If you need medical advice or medical care, please contact your doctor. And while you're in the waiting room, please follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at HiEverybodyMD. Hi, everybody. I'm Jackson Bain. I'm Johnny Kolosinski. You might remember me from such podcasts as There's Something About Barry, the erotic fan fiction of Barack Obama's presidency. Uh, this is Hi, Everybody, a Bad Medicine podcast. <laughs> I broke good. Jackson this time. It's horrible. <laughs> so horrible. I broke Jackson. Uh, this is a podcast where every week we discuss bad medicine in television and film, what they get right and what they get wrong in portrayals of medicine. And look who's back. It's Greg Winter. Once again, we have Dr. Greg Winter. Hi. Uh, Hi, everybody. (laughs) Doctors Jackson and Winter, what are we going to be discussing uh, in this episode? So we're going to be discussing Seinfeld, but more importantly, season four, episode 20, The Junior Mint. Yes. Uh, Greg, do you want to set this episode up? Um, Or how we got to where we are right now? So, in this episode, uh, someone that Elaine had been dating has some injuries in the hospital, he has to get an operation, and uh, chaos ensues as nothing happens. Yeah, I mean, it's they said it was something about him needing a splenectomy, and I had a lot of questions about the splenectomy part. Okay, so what does your spleen do, first of all, for those of us who aren't doctors in the room like only me and Iggy the Cat? What the, your spleen does is it does two things. One, it filters out bad blood cells, but it also can help with infection, like encapsulated organisms, like um, pneumococcus is one of the big ones that you need to uh, filter out. So uh, that's why you, people who lose their spleen through injury or sickle cell need uh, that Prevnar vaccine to prevent getting infected with that type of organism. Is so it's, that why Taylor Swift has bad blood? Because she doesn't have a spleen. Oh, I am so oh, oh, So terrible. Um, there's, a, there's a few things your body can live without. You can live without a spleen. You can live without an appendix. You can live without Jake Gyllenhaal. Oh, <laughs> no, no, you no, you cannot. Donnie Darko is amazing-ish. Just don't watch it again. Just, yeah, it's a, it's a one-time view only. But yeah, your spleen is... It's essentially a glass vase is what I was taught it was in um, med school. Because it's so fragile... It gets damaged, and then it's just useless. So it just needs to get taken out of your body. But we don't know why Elaine's boyfriend needed his spleen out. They just said he needed it out. It's true. They don't talk about it. Um, Most of the time when people need their spleen out, it's due to traumatic injury like a car crash or somebody gets hit or something like that. Um, And usually when someone needs their spleen out, they need it out immediately. It is not a question of... No one is sitting in the hospital in a room... With no monitor, their with no right. monitors or fluids or anything, yeah. just chilling in the room, waiting. I mean, there are cases where you have mono that's really bad, but you don't get your spleen out for that unless you were an idiot and you played football afterward, which that happens a lot more than you think. It it does it does happen because your spleen gets gigantic, and since we already talked about how it's a glass vase. Any kind of injury will just cause it to rupture, yeah. and then you bleed out. My freshman year in college, uh, someone on my rowing team had mono, and then couldn't exercise for two months because they were worried about his spleen. You mean repeated trauma with the oar into your abdomen is not a bad is a bad thing? Apparently, oh. I mean I'm not a doctor. It feels but... like they're rowing wrong if they're hitting themselves <laughs> in the. Ab- I... It's not. A, it's not a physics podcast. It's not a rowing podcast. Yeah, this but is, this is not a bad toxin <laughs> podcast. Yeah. <laughs> I like that you introduced the word coxswain into this podcast. I'm the winningest one-eyed coxswain in uh-huh. Big Ten history. Oh my gosh. What? Yeah, in that I almost won a race. Johnny, I like you a little bit more every time I see you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I think when they were setting up the episode, he's just chilling out in his room. He looks great. It doesn't look like he's in any pain at all. And if you had something wrong with your spleen, let's say it did rupture, he would look pale as a ghost. And yeah, just... Your spleen deals with a lot of blood, so if you have a rupture to it, you are losing a lot of blood through it, so you are going to be anemic, you're going to look pale, you're going to be tired, you're going to be sleepy. I mean, this is something where you're getting units of blood, you're going to emergency surgery very quickly. It's, it's not like 
maybe your spleen needs to come out. It, it's we're taking your spleen. It out. can come out later this week. Is yeah. kind of what it sounded yeah, like. Yeah, it, it's it's. It, I think they learned about it Tuesday. They visited him Wednesday, and it came out the on surgery Thursday. was Thursday. Yeah, which that's a good uh, setup for the timeline we'll, we'll touch on later. But kind of going on to the B plot of Kramer looking for gloves. Man, he snooped around a lot, and I don't know how he snooped around so easily. I mean, you're right. It's weird that he was able to snoop around so easily because he was not wearing a white coat. Yeah. Had he been wearing a white coat, probably he could have snooped around a little bit easier. While we were watching the the show earlier, you can see him kind of going in and out of doors, and that's not a thing that you can do anymore. Every Every door with things behind it, other than patients, are locked by some sort of code or some sort of key. So there's no really free access to that. Also, those door latches were really weak. Because he could just push <laughs> he, so gently. Yeah, he did not try to open a door. No, he, just he just pushed, pushed super gently. Those are all bathroom doors. Yeah. And then he did all of this just to look for gloves so he can retile his... Re-wallpaper his house. I mean, gloves are expensive. If you, if you go are... to a, a, convenience, a convenience type store, uh-huh. gloves are expensive. If you go to Costco, they're not quite as expensive. Um, but that is a huge care issue for people that are doing care at home or um if if you have home health it's like that stuff is is on the patient and patient's family and that that adds up really quickly and because you kind of need gloves for this it, they they're at a premium i would so al- i totally understand why he was doing it it's just not ethical <laughs> i also would think that if they want gloves like you said we use them quite a bit wouldn't that be on the cart Because you would try to use gloves a lot more and not in a room that's tucked away. Because that would be really weird. Like, if you need to examine a patient, like, I got to go back. I got to go into this room. And and in truth, the gloves are actually in the patient's room all the time. I mean, at least the medium gloves, which don't work for me, but brag. (laughs) But they're fine to jack They're Um, They're fine. They work. They're great. And one of the other things that we have now is that most, because of latex allergies, most of them are these this new type of nitrile. plastic ni- uh, they're nitro glo- and they are the worst <laughs> like they, i cannot even get my hands in them without ripping them and my hands become a bag of sweat so having nice gloves is good but you also pay for them i mean i, I get why he's doing what he's doing it's not right you shouldn't do it but i i get it yeah and i think it was also kind of telling too there were no gloves in his room <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's I mean, the easiest place for her to steal it. It just walks by, and like Kramer would do, bust through the room, take a whole handful, and just jam it down his pockets and go out. As as we've discussed numerous times, like this isn't this would be an unstable patient. He's going for surgery. He's got no monitoring. It just doesn't feel. Right. It doesn't. Yeah. The the urgency that would be there isn't there. Yeah. And then just speaking on the terms, of, or s- since we're on the subject of Kramer. The way he kind of asked the surgeon about the interabdominal retractors versus the intraabdominal retractors, it's nitpicky. I get it. But he was asking about that, um, if, if the ones that they used were on recall. That apparently it was, they were, it was on 2020 last night. Yes. And, then, and, you know, uh, and unfortunately, those are the types of questions you get as a doctor. Somebody, somebody's family member saw a story about something, and that's the question they're asking. Yeah. Even though it doesn't apply to what's happening, it's just... That's the thing they know about medicine, so that's the thing they want to talk about. Um, and often those are the most important things to respond to, because if a family doesn't trust what you're doing or saying, then they don't trust what's happening going forward. Yeah, and then to be honest, the retractors that he did use were super flimsy, so they should be on recall. They look like, they look like salad tongs that he was going in to scoop up like intestines and put them in a bowl. Like, so what, is, what does a retractor do? The retractors are what you use. The, the retractor to... doesn't scoop up anything. Yeah. The retractors just retract, which they, means they it hold just, it open. They hold the 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 hole open. And usually they have like med students hold it and so what... that you don't have to hold it with your teeth. Correct. I well, mean it's frowned upon. As as a med student, I had been in surgeries where I retracted for 8 hours. So yep. standing in a room holding things apart so that people could do whatever they so were actually in the doing. Hole. Um, and you all you're doing is being a warm body standing there holding things up. And the reason why, and then you might be thinking, why don't they just have something to mount and hold, keep it open? They do, 
But the reason why the surgeons that I worked with say that they have med students and what or residents retract is because eventually they get tired and let go a little bit of it enough so that there's not a prolonged pressure ulcer. Because if they use um, just like a, a brace or something like that, that pressure ulcer stays for too long and they don't the the healing and the recovery isn't as good. So they have med students hold it wide open as a person who gets tired you have to a tendency to readjust yeah. and so then you save some of that pressure on the skin yeah kids listening at home don't let anyone tell you that a career in medicine isn't 100 percent glamorous all the time oh, God. i don't retracting I, was the worst i remembered retracting for this like very obese person and i i remembered the doctor was like use both hands to retract and you put your weight into it so i was actually leaning backwards because it was so much you can do it. Tissue. Put your back into it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I wish I remembered who sang that song right now so I can quote it, but I can't. I think uh, it's genuine, but I don't know. Um, <laughs> link in the show notes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll link it in the show notes now. Um, so the, but yeah, usually they look kind of like scoops. Um, that's yep. probably the second scoop reference we've made in this mm-hmm. podcast. But it usually looks like scoops and you kind of, they're very strong steel that kind of hold them open. And I mean, they're just uh, they're different retractors based on what you're retracting. And as a medical student, you spend a lot of time in surgical suites holding things back so that people have a clear view of what they're doing. It's probably why I'm not a surgeon right now. I cannot. I had the shortest attention span for that. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> but then um, so going to like the main scene of this movie, Kramer finally does make it into the operating suite. I think because the attending physician even said, I'm here to show some of my med students what an operation looks like, and invites Kramer randomly into the well, suite. Kramer just has the ability to always be in the right place for nonsense at the right time. He does. And so, like, he's... I'm, he. I think he won an Emmy once? He won an he Emmy. he happened to be standing there? He also won the Emmy for this episode. Oh. It was actually his first Emmy he won, which was really random, but... Good, good piece of trivia right there. Um, so he gets invited up with the uh, with the medical students and kudos to Seinfeld, black doctor in the background. I like that. My uh, background is in theater. Do you have the same situation in surgeries as you do in theater, where sometimes you need to you know paper the house and invite your friends and family just to make the show look good on opening night? No, oh, God. no, definitely not. No. In fact, so so what they show there is an operating theater. And it's a theater for, I mean, named appropriately because you have an audience that's watching. That is not a thing that exists anymore. No, HIPAA it, and all that stuff. It's not. It's not even that. It's just like, like you saw what could potentially happen with that, right? Like, mm-hmm. oh, somebody dropped something. I mean, that guy would have. They would have noticed he Kramer would have been killed by somebody most likely. But it was a way, I mean, medicine is a practice, you learn by experience, and so you have to see these things happen so that you know what's going on, and that was a way to get people exposure to procedures. You have ex- you have the experts down there that are actually doing the procedure, and then there are people that are coming up in education watching it, and that is a part of what their educational experience was, is we're going to watch this procedure happen from a safe distance, assuming no one is eating. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that just doesn't exist anymore. Now, now in uh, medicine, as a medical student, you would be in a, you would be one extra person yeah. in there helping with a procedure. You wouldn't have a, a whole group of people there. Um, I found in my med school, in which is an older med school in Chicago, walking around just kind of exploring the building, I found one of the old operating theaters, and it's crazy to see it. Like you have a operating table up front, and then a huge, you know, like a. A movie theater style sloped classroom. Right seating. Yeah. yeah. Was and it separated with glass or was it just... No, it is straight there, in there. I mean, I'm sure that they uh, had ability to pull a curtain or something if something happened. But it was, hey, you can watch what is happening right here, right now. It was sort of crazy to see it. Although that room was locked poorly. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the, I mean, that stuff exists and that's part of training in something where not everything is... You can't learn everything through a book, right? You have to actually experience yeah. some of it. Yeah, and I think nowadays, it, like you mentioned, it's all kind of, it's an audience of one, basically, now, yeah. where the med student is the audience. 
but you got to earn your keep so that's why you become the human retractors at that point. yeah I, there there's a if you look at some renaissance paintings there are depictions of this and that's real like pe- you know you have people there holding people down because we didn't have pain control in the same way so you literally needed people there to control the patient but then also you have people there watching what's going on because you have to get experience in some way or another and speaking of pain control that patient didn't have a breathing tube or anything. <laughs> Which, he was just he was just lying there, just eh, he's breathing, he's breathing. But you heard the ventilator, <laughs> the ventilator and you know the ventilator exists because that's where the junior mint bounced off. According to Seinfeld, according who, to Seinfeld, uh, has is not an MD. No, but that's what he said. It bounced off, and usually in this kind of situation, when there's a surgery, especially involving the abdomen, there's always like a sheet between the anesthesiologist and the the surgeon, just to kind of keep things clean. Um, but separated enough just in case if something happens. So, so that there, no blood gets on the anesthesiologist's phone? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, uh, anesthesiologist. No, it's more because the mouth is dirty. The mouth is not sterile, and the anesthesiologist may have to retape, may have to do a bunch of stuff, and there's no, like, if you, if you have protection there, then you're not going to contaminate the surgical field. So you might as well put up some protection. The anesthesiologist can always lean around and say something, most of what the anesthesiologist is doing doesn't affect what the surgeon is doing. I, I mean, like, they're doing their own stuff, and it's important. Sudoku. Um, I, I have been Sorry. in a surgery where someone's paralytic was wearing off, and they started... Uh, no, yeah, they, their paralytic was wearing off, so they started to kind of contract a little bit, and it was pushing their insides yeah. out of the incision. And that's, like, a real thing. And, and the surgeon was like, hey something's wrong and the anesthesiologist peeks around and then they do their stuff and then everything's fine so that communication is definitely important it's just you could contaminate that field it's important to try to keep it as sterile as possible yeah. so the even something as simple as a sheet helps yeah and dirty mouths kind of transitions to how come no one was wearing a mask <laughs> like in the audience i go everyone i know in the operating area they were still following sterile procedure and whatnot wearing masks and hats and whatnot Jerry and Kramer and all the other med students all were wearing caps, but none of them were wearing masks. Well, you can't eat around a mask. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Obviously. I mean, that would make the junior mint just fly back out. Yeah, that would have been even more dangerous. Like, can you imagine Kramer just trying to like toss it up in the air and catch in his mouth with the mask on? Just bounces like a trampoline. You got Jerry and Kramer. You pay for those faces. You want to see them. You can't cover it up. You probably pay for those seats, too, to sit there. <laughs> I mean, Kramer said... You know, that's... Kramer got in because he, of where he was standing. Yeah. Why did Jerry get in? Because Kramer's date canceled on him. Uh, okay. Which is even a better <laughs> question. Why was he bringing a date? What kind of date is that? He knows what he's doing. I hope she's not squeamish with blood and just passes out. He knows what he's doing. <laughs> but yeah. So, I don't know how the doctor did not notice a junior mint falling. That, that was my question. Yeah. Is realistically, I would think that uh, there were there were four or five people down there actively paying attention, plus the med students mm-hmm. up above. Would you notice a junior mint in? I, I mean, it's entirely possible that everyone turned away at just the right moment and junior mint lands. Yeah. Um. There are a lot of things in place to make sure that the things that get put in your body come outside of your body during any surgery. So there are counts for sponges. So they actually have like a thing that with pockets that they'll put each sponge that they use into it to make sure the counts. Yeah. They count them as they go in, they count them as they go out. If you're using a procedure where, where metal things are going in the body, they will use what's called a a fluoroscopy, which is like kind of a lightweight x-ray to see if there's anything that shows up. Um, Some of the sponges and sponges and laps are the term for the same sort of thing. It's just an absorbative cloth that they can kind of put in and and, uh, soak up some blood. And some of those things have uh, have radio sensitive material in it. So if you look at it with a fluoroscope or fluoroscopy, it will show up so you can see them. I mean, one of that's one of the biggest hospital liabilities is like something left in. Yeah, it, it is somebody's watch. It should. Yes. It is literally a never event, right? That's yeah. that kind of thing should never happen. You know what you're putting in somebody. You should get all of those things out, um, and they lead to big lawsuits. Needles. And, yeah, you know any anything. Yeah. I mean, if needles, it's not supposed to be in you, it's it should, not. It should, it should not be, stay in right, you. Exactly. Um, and so there are so many things in place to 
protect you from the, from what people know are going into. Although if something random had like if all of a sudden a fly was in the operating room and it flew into your body, no one would know to check for that if yeah. nobody mm-hmm. saw it. So it's about somebody seeing it. If nobody saw it, nobody would be looking for it. Yeah. It would just be some random thing covered in blood in your body, and uh, there's no reason to pull that out. Yeah, They sewed them up so quick, though, allegedly, because they said, oh, we sewed them up and we didn't see it. Like, I get it. Like, a junior mint kind of looks like a blood clot in the right scenario, but if you're dealing with a blood clot that's still in your abdominal cavity most of the time the surgeons will wipe it away so that's I'm true th- they want to they want to see a clean what looks pretty clean and normal surgeons are working pretty hard to make sure that your surgery goes well it makes them look good they want to have a good outcome as much as you want them to have a good yeah. outcome so not noticing something that looks like a clot or a junior mint in the abdomen is usually poor form but if they didn't there's notice a, it there's a lot of stuff in your gut though, so it's yeah, really true. easy to just like eh, everything looks okay i mean he should be really sick like have a really bad infection going on that's true i don't believe kramer was wearing gloves i'm assuming <laughs> that he didn't wash his hands when he walked in there he i mean all of us have bacteria that's part of how our bodies work he would have a bad infection yeah he would be real real sick i mean right he almost died that's fair. But then he was healed by the power of hope and art. And junior mints. And junior mints. Um, would something like food be worse than something like a sponge? It depends, really. I, I don't... I, I mean, this is speculation. But, yes. <laughs> so, I mean... This is speculation, but 100% definitely. Well, food has stuff germs. on it, right? Like, food is covered with germs. So, a, a sponge that they're using to, to help stop bleeding in your body that is presumably sterile like anything that goes into you or touches you during an operation better be been sterile boiled and sterilized and a whole bunch of stuff so that it doesn't increase your risk of an infection if you brought food in i mean food has got like it, the second you touch it it has your germs on it let alone whatever other germs are on it it so. is junior mints are the germiest of foods <laughs> <laughs> it looks yeah. like a little poop it does look like a little poop <laughs> um but yeah, I mean, like you, that that would certainly lead to an infection. Where whereas leaving something in somebody might lead to other problems for other reasons, unlikely to be an infection. Just un, it, that would be a problem. Food would be a huge problem. Yeah. That's why they don't allow food in the operating theater. And that's <laughs> probably why they Can don't we... allow operating theaters. So I'm not, that's why they got mad at me because I brought a big gulp in because it was a really long <laughs> surgery. <laughs> Did that really happen? No. Okay, good. No, they'll stop you like the minute you get to the, the locker room. Oh, yeah, they would not even. Those are, <laughs> those, those I, are long surgeries. I, I fell asleep doing do, uh, doing retraction on someone as a med student. Same. And, yeah, because you you're sitting there it's being so silent. Boring. It's boring. No one is talking to you because that's you're how a I got, med student. I got smacked because of that. And that also, I did not get kicked out of that surgery. They were like, hey, wake up. Okay. My my attending medicine is tough. My attending told me you're paying so you can learn. Now wake up and continue retracting. <laughs> right now, now wake up and I won't teach you anything. Yeah, it was a long, long day. That it was a twelve hour surgery. That is incredible to me that that both of you did, which means it's oh, I mean, it's, a, a common thing that sur- happens. Surgical rotations are insane. I don't know how surgical residents do what they do, yeah. but it's you know up it's, at the hospital at four in the morning and go home at seven. Yeah. If you're lucky. Yeah. So it's really tough. That's why not, and neither is, of us are surgeons. It is mentally and physically demanding. Yeah. I would not do it, hence why I did not do it. Yeah. That's why I'm in emergency medicine. My attention span is too short. <laughs> so that's why I'm on that one. And I think kind of just looping back to the episode, one final thing was if we go back to the timeline of his illness and surgery and recovery. So Tuesday was spleen. Uh, he found out he was sick. Wednesday, they visited him. Thursday was surgery. And Friday was the recovery day. And he was eating a whole plate of spaghetti right after (laughs) serious abdominal surgery. (laughs) (laughs) That is not accurate. Uh, A lot of... I mean, when you have any sort of bowel surgery, there is bowel rest after it. Granted, the new teaching is you want to get things moving kind of as quickly as possible. But you start clear liquids and you kind of move up from there. Um sort of the more we learn about recovery we people do better outside of the hospital the hospital is full of sick people and germs so 
you want to get them out and to get them out you need to make sure their guts are working yeah. but you're not starting but you with don't spaghetti. start with a bolognese <laughs> no, no <laughs> definitely you, not a, do you know what the first sign is johnny sauce. that we would ask the patient if they're ready to eat are you hungry no actually oh, it's one of them it's when they're passing gas, That's, when they're farting. Ah. Did you fart today? Oh, okay. Looks like you're ready for food. But definitely Maybe not. some Chipotle. <laughs> <laughs> that would also create more farting and other issues at that point. Sponsor us, Chipotle. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but that would be the big thing is just you're not going to eat a whole plate of spaghetti after you had such serious abdominal injury. There would be so much vomiting after that kind of thing because your gut's not moving at that point. So that would be a big no-no. Also, he had like every single fatty food on there. He had ice cream. Yeah, you go, you go real milk. slow. You go real gentle. And, and I mean, you can you can move quickly, but it's like meal one is clear liquids. Meal two is what's I don't know, like Jello. Jello. It's, <laughs> like it's, it's clear liquids followed by more clear liquids, and then like non- cheesecake factory, cheesecake factory, Chipotle, all you can eat Korean barbecue. That's yeah. usually the the. No. Um, usually you get something bland um, that's easy to Cheesecake digest. Factory. That is something just a bland, burn something right onto Cheesecake Factory right there. Um, but yeah, you wouldn't go that hard. And that's just not a good, safe recovery. He'd have a lot of belly pain, too. And especially if you're having a, such a serious surgery like a splenectomy, you wouldn't be out of the hospital that quickly, either. Like They kind of made it sound like he was on the road to recovery and going to go home pretty quick. No, he was he was making dates for Friday. Friday, yeah. He was gonna go somewhere, but Elaine had plans at the Poconos, possibly, but didn't. Depends on what they were gonna do. Too sure. You don't want to pop those stitches. Um, to me, this was, so. To me, one of the things that was really interesting about this episode, and it's something that my dad brought up to me. Shout out to Doctor Winter, the real Doctor Winter. Um, if you look at this episode, you see the doctor that they're talking to. He's got a stethoscope hanging around his neck by the ear pieces. And that is the way people used to wear their stethoscopes. Um, that, that is so that you can quickly put it into your ears and start listening to a patient if something is wrong. If you show up in a room and like, oh, what's going on? You can start doing your job. Um, that is not how I ever have worn my stethoscope in my entire life. My stethoscope has always been hung around my neck in the style of ER. And I... I didn't even know about the way that they showed in in this Seinfeld episode until my dad was talking about it. And um, basically, in when ER started as a show, they used that hang around your neck as just because it looks cooler, and it does look cooler for sure. It looks cooler. <laughs> but also, it makes it hard to use it. It makes yeah. it harder to doctor. Right. And and it's like a very weird thing because uh, sort of my generation of doctors that grew i mean like er is sort of our example of your you know that's this that's what you see as doctors that was doing the, the, the quintessential medical right. show at that time and and um so that's kind of what we all emulated but it's also not like it's not helpful and it doesn't work for your job but then hearing somebody else say that they used to do it like this you're like no way that didn't happen but if i mean clearly seinfeld had a they have a doctor consultant for sure. Like every show that is doing something with a doctor, that is what they used to do. Also, I have a medical consultant. That is what they used to do. Just a very weird thing to see. Like this was this came out a year before ER came right. out. Yep. Yeah, this we was ninety three and earlier. ER was ninety four. And that may, it's like oh, you can see a clear transition from the the TV depiction of a doctor from how they wear their stethoscope, which then affected the way actual doctors wore their stethoscopes because we are just as stupid as everyone else <laughs> i mean it's it's really interesting and also that's still how i wear my th- stethoscope around my neck because because rule of cool yeah that's how they did it in er that's because i gotta do what everyone else does i mean that's hey i saw it on tv it's gotta be right most of the time, it's right. <laughs> most of the time <laughs> it used to be right not so much anymore. no it is now it's still right because now that's what we do it's yeah. very it's so weird next it will be the holsters i was talking with some of some of the other doctors that we know and they didn't even believe me when i told like they didn't believe me <laughs> it's like okay I've gotta probably watch an episode of chicago hope or something before er and see if they still do it in that one they do oh they if you if you look anything you see you will see there it is it is 
clipped around their neck. We'll toss a couple pictures of a screenshot of this and some pictures from ER in 94 and compare on our Instagram. And just a side note, it's also really hard to run with the stethoscope dangling like that, though. As we've talked. Because it'll just keep knocking you over and over again. But there's no running in the ER. If there's one thing I've learned from from this podcast, it's there's no running in the ER. Correct. Not a lot. running in baseball either. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) All right. Wait, no, no. No. Actually, I have one other dumb thing to say. When this came out, I think I was in high school. I'm assuming I was in high school. I must have been. That's when I saw all of Seinfeld. The punchline of this is that her name is Dolores, which is a yeah. Rhymes with a there, so C plot is <laughs> Jerry doesn't know his girlfriend's name, uh, and uh, she says, "Oh, it rhymes with a female blo- body part," and he's trying to you know suss that out in whatever way he Clip can, on. and eventually he realizes it's Dolores. And when this aired in high school, I didn't understand it, and I'm... Well, that's because Dolores doesn't actually rhyme. It does. And it explains some things about my relationships. <laughs> <laughs> I get it now. If you can't find that rhyme. I mean, yeah. yeah. So, we've talked about a lot in this episode. This this episode of Hi Everybody might be longer than the episode of Seinfeld. Uh, how <laughs> would good. we fix this episode? How would we make it more medically accurate? He should look real septic, I think. If That's he, true. If, he, he got, if you got a junior mint in your belly, um, your symptoms might not show up right away, but definitely during that recovery phase when he's trying to eat spaghetti, he should look real sick. Yeah, would he, be, would, he, would be, he would look real, real sick before he started to look better. Yeah. Um, also, they wouldn't have been able to visit him before his splenectomy because they would have found out after his emergency splenectomy. There would be more gloves in the room. More gloves in the room. That Kramer probably would just walk out with a box, let's be honest. And Jerry's girlfriend would have left after he didn't know her. That's accurate. Yeah. Yeah. You can't not know someone's (laughs) name. It doesn't work. Yeah. I mean, there's an easier way to find out someone's name. Just introduce them to your friend. He tried that. He did. Don't you? Yeah. (laughs) Clearly, you were not watching. I did not pay attention to that part. Yeah, I, I would, I mean, That's frankly, what, I'd say that there's mutual issues there because yeah. she doesn't pick up on social cues. Jason Alexander tries so hard and it he tries without any prompting and he's just like, I tried. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think there was so, there, this was a good, just ridiculous episode of Seinfeld that kind of just sums up the it's about nothing kind of thing. But the Junior Mints getting brought into the operating suite pretty much just was the big old yeah, downfall it, yeah. of the whole thing if you're having people in the op- in the operating suite if you're in a place that still has that which you're not you're not bringing anything yeah. <laughs> you are and you're also wearing face masks yeah. for it's, sure it's also impossible to bring someone into like the hospital area without any kind of clearance these days like you need your photo taken they'll scan your id it's just impossible to get in if they were doing this now it'd probably just be a twitch stream oh god <laughs> it probably would be and they're just know have enough people watching on there and then the surgeon at the end would just say support my yeah. patreon yeah don't forget to smash subscribe. Smash, that, <laughs> smash that like and subscribe button please do that for ours and then yeah yeah um speaking of which you can find this podcast because uh, i'm horrible at introducing this in the beginning of the episode but uh since you've made it this far follow us on facebook twitter and instagram at hi everybody md if if people are listening to it and they're at the beginning, they don't need to know how to find it. Yeah. Oh. It's okay to introduce it at the end. I'll, yeah. I'll aim for both for you. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, please subscribe. Uh, tell everyone who would like about this podcast. Yeah. To listen to our podcast. Yeah, we're um, we're starting to plan out our horror movie October. So if you have some horror movie ideas, uh, shoot those our way. Uh, we're definitely thinking... I'm, we're thinking about one that's 100% medically accurate. But before that, we're going to be doing Die Another Day, uh, which is one of the most medically accurate Bond films. So stay tuned for that one. <laughs> but thank you for listening. Yep. And we'll see you next week. Yep, see you next week.